We're going to get started in just a moment. I wanted to ask real quick, uh, which of these kind of three sections here is the most hungover right now? Which one? Is this the middle one, I think? It's John. So just a fun, silly thing before we actually start the session today. Uh, I'll ask you to, to join me in this. Um, when I say go, okay, I'll ask you all to just applaud like crazy as if what I just said was the best thing you've heard at DrupalCon all week, and the people walking by in the hall will really want to come in. <laughs> okay, here we go. Ready? One, two, three, go. This is the session to be at. So we'll get started. Welcome, everybody, to Web Personalization for Drupal, your roadmap to get started. My name is Dave Sawyer. I'm a senior solutions architect at FFW. Right here is my friend John. Hi, my name is John Muddy. I'm a solutions architect at Acquia. Here's a quick overview of the agenda, what we'll be talking about today. We'll be sort of defining what personalization is relative to digital experiences. We'll talk about some of the benefits of implementing personalization and some of the challenges and risks associated with it. We'll talk about the prerequisites, the things you should be thinking about before attempting to implement a personalization strategy. We'll review some of the criteria for how content and experiences can be personalized. John will walk you through uh, personalization in practice with an example use case. We'll talk about some specific Drupal modules and other solutions for Drupal. And we'll close by summarizing why we think Drupal is the best CMS for personalization. And we'll have some time for questions at the end. So first of all, what is personalization? Well, in a broad sense, I define personalization or web personalization as tailoring a digital experience to the interests and needs of an individual user. In other words, it's about delivering a relevant user experience to each visitor of the website or application. It's about delivering the right content to the user when they need it most. Nearly 75% of users get frustrated with websites when content offers, ads, promotions, etc. appear that have nothing to do with their interests. There have been many studies to back this up, and if you think about it, it just kind of makes sense. Users want and need what's relevant to them. But it's not just about relevance, it's about timing and other contexts. It's about the information they need at the time that they need it too. So personalization really is a process of optimizing a digital experience. More so than just time and other context, it's about the right content at the right place, in the right channel, at the right time, in the right format, on the right device, in the right language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So really personalization is a way to take a di uh, digital experience and optimize it with all of these factors so that the digital experience is most effective for the given business objective. So what's new about personalization? When first doing this talk at Drupal camps and other places, one of the questions that came up in early discussion is, why is this a hot topic today? Many of you may be familiar with this topic uh, in digital marketing. Why is it a hot topic today? And if you look, here's an image from Google Trends that shows uh, just the word personalization. We see an increase over the last 10 years or so. And if you look on uh, blogs and other media, we continue to see more coverage of personalization in digital experiences. So think way back. Uh, anybody here, was anybody here developing for the web or working in a, a web, in a web capacity in the 90s? Right, show have many of you, right? All right, Netscape Navigator. So this is actually a screenshot of my Yahoo from about 1999. And what you see here is personalization calls to action way back in the, in the 90s, right? Uh, personalize this site, customize to see only things of interest to you. So obviously, personalization on websites has been around a long time. And certainly, if you look at my Yahoo, this is something closer to today, uh, we see the same idea, right? It calls to add content, personalize the experience to your needs. So really, the question is, what's new about personalization? 
Well, part of what's new is that changes in both culture and technology today have resulted in a shift of consumer expectations. Brands like those you see here have set the new norm. People who use Netflix, Amazon, and other services are accustomed to having digital experiences tailored to their specific needs. And so the basic idea is that since this is becoming the new norm, the customers of your given businesses are also having similar exceptions, which is why John and I both feel that personalization is no longer a nice to have or an extra add-on optimization. It's becoming an essential part of delivering an effective digital experience. Amazon is a great example. Almost every aspect of the digital experience or the shopping experience on Amazon is personalized to each individual customer. When you ask buyers what they want from their shopping experiences, they tell you they want to be recognized, they want to be valued, and they want to be known. This is a quote from a research director at Gardner. So there's this idea then of what's referred to often as one-to-one -one marketing. Wikipedia defines it as a marketing strategy by which companies leverage data analysis and digital technology to deliver individualized messages and product offerings to current or prospective customers. Which really brings us to the, back to the question, what's new about personalization? This is really at the heart of it. Personalization today is really referred to as real-time personalization, which I define as identifying site visitors based on various criteria and serving targeted variations of content in order to deliver the most relevant experiences to each user. Oftentimes, if we're thinking of personalization as a process of site optimization, when we're trying to optimize the site, we're trying to improve something, and we're usually trying to increase something. So in most cases, we're looking at uh, some sort of a lift or an increase on a metric. So in a higher ed uh, environment, for example, maybe the business objective is to reach more prospective students. Uh, maybe a publisher wants to reach more paid subscribers. Uh, a corporate or B2B site wants to maybe generate more leads off of their website or a social cause or a nonprofit site wants to get more donors, for example. But in all cases, the process of optimization is focused around a specific business objective and therefore a metric that you're trying to improve. And personalization is used as a strategy for just this purpose. In other words, it's a way to contribute to growth. <coughs> Benefits and challenges. The benefits of personalization are clear, and there have been many, many studies, I won't be able to elaborate on all of them today, that talk about why personalization can really yield some very, very valuable and positive results for your businesses. Companies that use data to deliver personalized experiences have a 49% higher revenue growth and 30% higher ROI than those who do not. We see the benefits including positive impact on conversion rates, higher stickiness of content, increased levels of user engagement, and businesses having deeper insights into the customer's needs as a result of this process, and really a more effective website or a more effective digital experience overall. Well, that sounds great, but it turns out, while this concept is actually easy to understand, the process of implementing personalization is actually very challenging. And I think that's because personalization is not one distinct skill set. It actually touches across a lot of different areas. It involves content strategy, user experience, visual design, digital marketing, and certainly web technology. So implementing an effective personalization strategy involves lots of discrete skill sets that are often difficult to assemble within an organization. And this is not something that is specific to one business or one industry. Many studies have been done to back this up. 75% of marketers believe that personalization is important to their organization's long-term goals, but most have a long way to go to arrive at efficient, effective personalization for their customers and prospects. This was from a digital marketing optimization survey conducted by Adobe just a couple years ago, and this remains very much true today. This is certainly something that we found in talking to our clients at FFW. So, many, many common challenges. I'm not going to read them all, but some of them include technical complexity, 
performance and caching problems that are introduced by the overhead of dynamic content, uh, barriers with IT, privacy concerns, depending on what country you're in, this can be more or less of an issue, uh, lack of in-house digital marketing, et cetera. So the whole process can be overwhelming. So the question is really, where do I begin? How do I get started with personalization? Before you get to a very advanced and complex strategy, what are the first steps to take? And the way we'll approach answering that question is by walking through just a short list of prerequisites, things that you should have answers to or have a process for before you embark on implementing a personalization solution. So the first prerequisite is how you'll segment your audience. The concept of visitor segmentation is really important to personalization because we remember what we're doing is we're taking our content and we're tailing it, tailoring it to each different types of user. So segmentation, therefore, is the process of dividing up our audience into distinct groups based on some set of criteria. And how you'll approach this is specific absolutely to your, to your business. There's no one way. This may be demographic in nature, breaking audiences up by age, for example. Uh, this may be more to do with what market segment or customer segment they are. Um, this may have to do with more traditional marketing personas. We spoke briefly before about a higher ed example, the idea of targeting content to prospective students as opposed to alumni, different segments or audiences in that way. You'll need to have some answers to these questions. Prerequisite number two, understand how your customers engage. So simple, but so important. Many businesses, surprisingly, are not completely in touch <laughs> with how their customers are engaging. And I believe that's not because they're ignorant to the fact, that's because that the industry is transformative and evolving. So while they may have been really uh, having insights into how their customers engaged a year or two ago, they might be losing touch with how their customers are engaging today. It's important to research and understand clearly how the segments engage with your business and what the buyer's journey is, what the different steps they take along the way in a purchase life cycle or buying process. This typically will involve a research process, some discovery, or some process of documenting what the customer's needs are along the way, certainly talking to customers. If these aren't skill sets that you have internally in your team, work with a consultant or a digital agency that can bring these skills to the table. Prerequisite number three, develop a content strategy. Or if you already have one, ask questions about how your content strategy, sh strategy should adapt to personalization. Remember, it's not just about writing content. It's about writing lots of variations on content that are targeted to different types of users. And producing content and producing quality content is certainly a challenge for many organizations. In personalization, we need to be thinking about the reuse of content and the content across different channels. And of course, have a great CMS that enables non-technical users to effectively update content. Rock on Drupal. Prerequisite number four, define how you will measure success. A process of optimization is essentially pointless if you don't know if it was successful or not. So it's important to know going into it what metrics you're gonna use to determine if it worked. Oftentimes, this involves configuring your analytics to surface important metrics so you understand. Metrics may be something as simple as a conversion. In other words, maybe the number of people that hit a thank you page after a sign-up form. Metrics could also be much more complex KPIs. But in any case, it's important to know what those metrics will be so that as you implement personalization, you know what you're going to measure your optimization against. And finally, prerequisite number five, adopt a data-driven mindset. Personalization is inherently experimental. It's about making some changes, targeting some content, and seeing if it performed effectively. So as a result, we rely heavily on a data-driven approach. We rely on our analytics. We rely on the numbers to inform if the process was successful. If you don't have in-house expertise with anal analyzing your analytics, again, work with a consultant or a digital agency who can bring those skills to the table. 
And enjoy digging into the numbers if you're not already doing so. They're gold. They're absolutely full of insights. Uh, as a tip for those who are not really into analytics but want to develop some just basic familiarity, Google provides free online training through what they call Google Analytics a Academy. It's very easy. You can walk through some of the key concepts in that way to get yourself up to speed. Be prepared to experiment. Good optimization is about testing and determining what performs best. So you'll probably have some optimizations or some personalizations that don't work out. And that's OK. In getting started with personalization, it's important to be, to be aware that this process is inherently experimental. So again, following a data-driven approach to determine what works and what doesn't and being willing to try some tests and make some experience, experiments is the name of the game. Try using a tool that makes building quick variations of content easy for non-technical users, A-B tests, for example. And as always, fo focus always on experiments that can be measured. So we're going to walk through briefly some of the criteria that's used to personalize the digital experience. What do we use to tailor the, the, the content? How do we know who gets to see which content and who gets to see the other content? In this conversation about personalization criteria, the categories involved are often two things, implicit and explicit criteria. And conversations around personalization strategy often think of criteria in this way. Implicit criteria being criteria that's implied but not plainly expressed. These are often the basis for predictions or indicators of a user's intention without actually knowing what their intention is. So an example would be looking at the click path a visitor takes through your site and making assumptions, essentially, on what their interests are based on what content they viewed. Explicit criteria, by comparison, is criteria that's just clear, leaving no room for confusion or doubt. Uh, examples would be, this visitor is connecting from Safari on iOS, or this visitor has chosen a language preference of English. It's explicitly stated. It's not assumed. Other criteria involves personal data provided by the user. Personal data such as age, gender, language preferences or interests, etc. This often involves something called self-selection or self-identification. So an example might be topic subscription. Someone on a news site fills out topics or categories they're interested in and news is displayed relevant to the categories they explicitly stated. Here's an example of just that thing on NBCNews.com. Another, another category criteria is non-personally identifying attributes. So these are attributes that are automatically detected by the website, in this case. This can be based on IP address to determine their approximate physical location, the type of computer or mobile device, the browser they're using, the operating system they're using. An exa a simple example of this would be geotargeting for regional content. If you've ever typed in uh, the Huffington Post, if you're in the US, it automatically takes you to HuffingtonPost.com. If you're in the UK, it takes you to HuffingtonPost.co.uk. The user doesn't have to choose their country in that way. The, this is detected automatically, and the, the user is directed to the most relevant site for them. User interactions. How are they interacting with the site or app? What are the attributes of that user session? For example, what's the date and time when they're accessing the site? What is the referring URL that brought them there? Uh, what click path did they take through the site? If your site uses a search feature, like Drupal's built-in search feature, for example, what keywords are they typing into the search feature? Uh, if they started to fill out a form and then abandoned that form and didn't complete it, what fields did they fill out and where did they kind of fall off in that way? So all aspects of the interactions can be used to inform a personalization strategy. And finally, uh, first and third party data. Um, Visitor history profile data collected from third-party services. Um, for example, a CRM like Salesforce has a customer record. If you can identify the visitor as a specific customer, then you can make that connection between that user and the record that is in your Salesforce CRM and use data in that Salesforce record to inform what content they see on the site. Uh, for another example, if, you're, if your site uses a login with Facebook feature where they're identifying themselves, you can use data from the Facebook social profile, again, to inform what content you present to the user in the digital experience. 
Earlier I talked about back in 1999, My Yahoo had personalization features in it. Personalization for authenticated users is oftentimes a lot simpler because the user is logging in and inherently identifying themselves in the process. In this way, we see content being personalized on retailer sites like Amazon.com, membership sites, dating sites, for example, Match.com, highly personalized experiences, um, recommendation engines like Netflix and Pandora, but in all these cases, the user is logging into an account where they have some history and preferences to personalize against. It tends to be a little trickier is personalizing for anonymous users where there's no person logging in necessarily. Uh, they start out as a completely anonymous visitor. And in this process, we build a profile over time and we take any information we have initially and we start to store that in the profile. And we go slowly from completely anonymous to someone that we start to understand more and more about as they continue to interact with the site. I'll now hand it over to John, who's going to walk through an example use case. Thanks, Dave. Um, before I start, how many people here in the room already have personalization on your own properties or, or for your clients that you're working on right now? That's about half. That's fantastic. So I asked that about, I do a lot of demos, many, many, many demos in my job. And I would say well over half of them involve personalization today. So it's. Um, it's, it's a pervasive topic. I'm going to take the framework that Dave kind of laid out and um, boil it down for uh, actual clients that we've implemented. I've kind of you know, protected the innocent and scrubbed you know, the actual uh, clients in this case. But this is um, how we approach the personalization on their properties. Um, in this case, we're going to talk about Drupal University. Um, and the first thing we want to talk about uh, when we do an implementation like this is taxonomy, right? Um, you really have to understand the categorization that's specific to your business. This is probably one that's adaptable. If, you're, if there's any universities or EDU institutions, you can probably take that as is, more or less. Um, but you know, your business is going to differ. Um, but this is the critical first step: is building your taxonomy. This next step. Um, is identifying the journey. Like, what is it that we want visitors to do throughout their life cycle with, with, your, with your property? And what are the specific goals that we want them to achieve? And, and this, is, again, is, is something that we've mapped out for some of our clients in different, uh, different industries. Um, I'm going to focus on just the first step, because when we think about implementing personalization, as David said earlier, it's about showing immediate result, right? Um, it's increasing the funnel. It's increasing uh, 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 the value of customers. So for a university, it's usually about acquiring new, new, new prospect, uh, prospect students. So drilling in, we're going to look at an example here. This is uh, Taylor. Taylor is a high school junior. Um, and she's coming to your website for the first time. Um, she's going to immediately begin to tell you things about herself. Just based on her, based on her uh, click trail. We call this behavioral personalization. Um, based on her behavior, she's raising her hand and telling you what she's interested in. So she's gonna click on the admissions page there and um, she's gonna drill down into undergraduate admissions and right away we can begin to segment her into, uh, into an audience. We can segment into her based on what she's looking for and when she comes back, whether it's the same visit or a week later, we're gonna tailor her call to action. Um, in this case, uh, we want to uh, have her move to the next step of some sort of funnel. Usually the first step of a funnel for a university is come on site, right? We want you to come on site and, and see the campus. And so this would be a, a good example of a call to action. Moving on, um, we might say that, you know, maybe it's a month later, she reads an article in TechCrunch and she's starting to think about what she's going to do at this university, really picture herself attending there. And, and the next step would be, what's her major going to be? Um, so we want to begin to tailor uh, the experience based on that, that major, that express major. Smartly, she's going to uh, major in computer science and uh, starts to read some articles. And, and the key thing here is that it's not always, you know, it's not always when you're doing behavioral personalization, you don't want to just pick up and automatically put someone into a category. She might have accidentally looked at anthropology. Um, I hope there's no anthropologists in the room, but uh, she stumbled in a different field. We want to we want to see what her, her interest is um, and then aggregate that and say, where does it rank among all possible interests? So there's going to be some sort of ranking algorithm for um, saying that she's really definitively interested in computer science. And it's a very simple example. It might be a trigger that she read three or more articles on this particular, uh, particular topic. So again, when she comes back to the home page, there's your call to action. We're trying to give her messaging that is specific to 
why you want to come to, uh, to Drupal U, um, why you want to major in computer science, look at all these people that were, were graduating and they're getting great uh, careers, and the next step, apply now, right? Continuing to drive towards the funnel. I'm gonna switch gears here and look at another audience. This is gonna be um, Taylor's mom. So Taylor's now talking about Drupal U all the time, every, every night at dinner table, and so her mom comes to the site and uh, uh, wants to see what this is all about. So her experience is the same. She starts out at the home page. It's not personalized. She clicks on the parents link up top. Um, and right away, we're going to be able to put her in, a, in, a, uh, in an audience that, just like we wanted a Taylor to come to this uh, campus, in this case, we want Dee to come, and we're going to highlight there's a family weekend, um, come see uh, other parents and that sort of thing. So we can personalize the content that we're, we're delivering to her right away. Um, but really what we want to do is, is overcome her, um, you know, she's going to have natural barriers to should I apply at this school, have, I, have my student apply at this school, what are, what, are, what are the issues, and financial aid tends to be one of the big ones. Um, so we want to drive Taylor's mom now, D, through this process. And what that's going to look like is, again, trying to pick up cues on the things that she's interested in. In this case, she's reading articles about, you know, is it a good value school or um, uh, investing, you know, am I going to get a return on my investment uh, for, for Taylor, her child? And we're going to put her into a segment. She's now a value buyer. We know that's what's driving her. Um, and the call to action here is financial aid. Back to the home page, apply for financial aid. Let's go ahead and try to get her through um, this process, the beginning of this process, uh, so that her, her child can actually come to the school. So we might present a, a price calculator. So she has a, a good understanding of how much it's actually going to cost uh, to attend uh, Drupal U. But based on her completing that price calculator, um, what we're going to be able to do now is really surface to D as she comes back to the site the things that are really important to her. It's not just you know, driving her towards a decision, it's when are financial aid deadlines and have you applied for these scholarships and really kind of um, making Drupal U uh, a better experience for, for uh, their consumer parent and, and children than other competing universities because presumably Taylor's looking at other, uh, other uh, schools as well. So I'll stop there and turn it back to Dave. Thanks, John. So now we'll talk a little bit about how to implement personalization on Drupal specifically. Implementing personalization today on Drupal actually depends very much on whether you're using Drupal 7 or Drupal 8. But in both cases, with Drupal 7 or Drupal 8, the name of the game is taxonomy and metadata. In other words, structured content is key to any personalization solution. Specifically in Drupal speak, using taxonomy vocabularies, and lots of them, to describe content in many different ways. These taxonomies, tags or categories, can then be used to inform how the content is targeted. Let me walk through just a few quick examples. Imagine five different taxonomy vocabularies that are exposed on one or more different content types. And as the content editors or marketers are filling out the content type forms and adding new content, they're filling out and tagging the content, content in all these ways that are not showing up in an outward facing way to the customer. They're showing up internally in the Drupal CMS so that we have classified the content in a lot of ways that are relevant to digital marketing or business objectives. One would be persona. We showed a slide earlier for higher ed with different tags or taxonomy terms to describe basically the marketing persona that the content is intended for. So if you run a corporate blog, for example, tag each blog post with the type of customer you're trying to speak to with that blog post. Uh, other examples might be uh, customer level, in other words, distinguishing between content that's really written for someone who's a new customer or someone who would like to become a customer or someone that has is a long-term customer, has been a customer for a long time, having different voices in those content and tagging them appropriately. Um, another one is a buying process step or what step of the purchase life cycle, uh, purchase life cycle or customer journey. Um, for example, content that's targeted towards people who are in the evaluation stages of making a purchase of the given product or service uh, might be distinguished between content that uh, is written for customers who are ready for purchase or maybe you have already made a purchase and are looking to become a repeat, repeat buyer in that way. Uh, content, what I call content subtype or content format, um, can often be a way to classify content a little bit further 
than just content types. So a good example of this would be a blog. Many, uh, many uh, websites that have a blog will use the blog content type in Drupal for all of the blog posts. But in reality, when you are maintaining a blog, maybe some of your blog posts are in the format of a short kind of update. Maybe the, another format is like a Q&A format, uh, et cetera. So sort of subtype classifications of all of the uh, content within a content type to define how that it might be segmented or targeted, targeted or recommended. And finally, uh, content lifespan. Sometimes we write content that is time sensitive. It's, it, the content or the nature of it is, is really only relevant for a period of time. Uh, other content, uh, a little bit more evergreen, that lives for a long time. And we can tag our content in this way to indicate how it might be shown or not to a user. If you are using Drupal 7, like many of us still are, uh, and you want to have a proof of concept, a way to kind of get your head around what's involved with setting up personalization on Drupal, uh, you maybe want to do a prototype internally to do a demo, uh, there's a module called personalization that I think is really ideal for this purpose. And the reason is you can download it, install it, and sort of out of the box, so to speak, it provides some of the functionality we've described today. Basically, it uses a taxonomy-based approach that maps either the user's location, physical location, or browsing history to relevant content. It provides a connection with a third-party service that does the location detection. And it provides the, the means of automatically associating what content they viewed to other content. And the way it's doing that, again, is with taxonomy. In other words, if I view a number of articles that have all been tagged with baseball, then it knows to recommend in a block other content that's been similarly tagged with baseball, and it provides this built-in functionality. It also includes a customizable scoring al algorithm, so you can use code to hone and tweak. What that looks like very quickly is when you install it, it enables a site personalization option in the configuration screen. You would set up your personas in the form of a taxonomy vocabulary like this. It also provides a search keyword mapping option. So if you do use the built-in search feature of Drupal, the words that they type into that feature can be used to map to a taxonomy term, which in turn can be mapped to content that's also tagged with that term. And basically what it's doing is setting a cookie on the anonymous user with some unique ID like that that's depicted here. And it's creating tables in the Drupal database that store this information and the individual profiles of the user. If you want to do something a little bit more advanced, again, with Drupal 7, then you can use the personalize module and the accompanying module, visitor actions. These modules are developed and maintained by Acquia, and they're good for a more comprehensive or a complex implementation on Drupal 7. They use what's called a decision agent approach to define criteria for automatically serving the most relevant variations of content. Um, there is no Drupal 8 roadmap with this approach. I should note that. But if you do install this on your Drupal 7 site today, similarly, it exposes a personalization settings option in your site configuration area. And you'll see, instead of just one module, it actually comes with a suite of modules which can be enabled to provide lots of different personalization functionality. The site structure menu in Drupal exposes some new options that allow you to configure how your personalization campaign is structured on your site. And basically, a simple example using this module might look like this. Let's say we have two blocks in Drupal. And this example might be for a travel company. And there are two promotions. One is a travel package for Paris, and one is a travel package for New York. So the idea is we configure these two possible blocks as a variation or variation set, and we configure that using the UI provided by this module. Then, it has this concept of a campaign, meaning once this has been uh, configured, we can turn the campaign, and the personalization campaign is then running on the site. It can be paused or enabled at any time. And it uses a kind of who, what, when metaphor to configure how the personalization campaign works in your Drupal site. In other words, what what variation set should be shown, who, who is the targeted user group or, or persona or visitor segment that should see it, and when, when should that be displayed. This again is 
from the configuration option from that module, just showing some of the details on how it exposes the UI to make these types of configurations. What we're looking at here specifically is a very simple implementation that just uses URL parameters. In other words, we have a page that depending on the UTM term parameter in the URL, a different block will be swapped out and displayed. Simple URL, URL parameter block swapping. So again, there's many different types of criteria that can be used. This example is just showing some URL parameters, but this can be completely customized and configured as well. So everything we've talked about so far in terms of these modules is enables you to personalize content with Drupal without the use of a third party service. But most effective personalization solutions today involve the use of a third party service. And there are many reasons for that, one of which is that when we're personalizing to anonymous visitors, what we're doing is we're making pages that might have been completely cached before, completely one size fits all. All of a sudden, those pages are dynamic for everybody. And there's a performance overhead to that. All of a sudden, anonymous page views have database reads and writes. So there's a performance overhead to doing this. A best practices approach is to ex externalize the user profiles for these anonymous visitors into some other system. And there are many of them in the marketplace today. I'll touch upon just a few right now. The first I'll mention is Acquia Lift. Won't be going into too much detail on Acquia Lift today, but if you're evaluating a personalization solution for Drupal, you might want to take a look at Lift. It provides deep integration with the Drupal API. It provides this idea of an externalized user profile. It works across channels and allows you to target content using Drupal and an external web GUI interface. Other examples in the marketplace of a third-party service that enables you to do personalization on Drupal sites are Optimizely. Optimizely historically has been a testing and A-B tool, A-B testing tool optimization uh, tool. They, they now have a personalization product offering. Um, this works, um, unlike the previous example, this works using uh, more of a JavaScript approach where you're embedding JavaScript in your Drupal site or in your templates and the third-party external personalization engine is swapping out content for you dynamically. And another one is Evergage. Uh, again, similarly, a third-party service integrated into your website, platform independent, allows tracking of visitor behaviors and provides the real-time personalization option that's configurable externally through a third-party GUI. So I'll pass it back to John. Thanks, Dave. So I, I wanted to kind of take it high level and take a step back. We're at DrupalCon, and, and I'm often asked, you know, why would I use Drupal as a CMS? And, and then I'm further asked, you know, what advantage does Drupal have for personalization relative to WordPress or Adobe or Sitecore or something like that? And I thought I'd share some thoughts with you on that uh, today. Um, and regardless of which way you choose to do personalization, whether it's a Drupal-only approach or use a third-party service, um, you should be leveraging these kind of fundamental building blocks of Drupal, and, and I'll highlight what it means for personalization. So here's that word again, taxonomy. Um, I think we've said it 15 times, um, but it really is the alpha and omega uh, of personalization. And what I specifically mean is that because it's a core functionality of Drupal, um, we have the ability to do things that other systems don't. For example, um, there's UX considerations. I want to lower the burden for my content editors and marketers to tag all of this content. How do I do that? Well, there's lots and lots of modules that improve the taxonomy interface. Um, taxonomy term reference is one of my favorite. Um, but there's also automated tagging based on, on textual analysis using Tag API or Open Calais. So we can continue to tag our content for appropriate personas and audiences and segments and all that good stuff without human intervention, which is an important thing. A second uh, major benefit of taxonomy relative to other systems is that it's a core entity. And for those that are in the room, what that basically means is that it's fieldable. I can add other fields to the taxonomy term, and it's exposed through um, services APIs. Why is that important for personalization? Well, sometimes this taxonomy or categorization needs to sync, in, sync up with other things. Um, for example, analytics. How am I going to sync up my categories between Google or, or um, Site Catalyst with, with Drupal? Services API is a perfect way to do that. I can move 
the terms back and forth between these different systems and have my analytics match up what Drupal sees. Um, the fact it's feedable, feelable is also pretty important. Imagine we have uh, a, a, a vocabulary describing location, and it's very simple, you know, Boston and New York and LA and New Orleans. There's other ways I might describe location. I might describe Boston based on its zip code, 02109. I might describe Boston based on its DMA code, 508, if I'm coming from, um, from uh, the advertising world. The idea is that I can take a single concept, Boston, and through the power of fields, extend what Boston means. It could be just the, the, the text, Boston. It could be a zip code. It could be a DMA code. Um, having these things fieldable turns out to be a really powerful thing. Second thing is um, the content modeling. And one of the things that I'd love to talk about with Drupal is that all of the content required to move a, a visitor through some sort of journey, buyer journey, can be done in Drupal. And, and as a best practice, I would suggest that you model it that way. So if you have a very simple, this is a very simple model of awareness and research and, and consideration and decision, you might choose a different model. Um, but there's corresponding content types that apply to each one of these stages. So if I'm just trying to get, you know, are you aware that you have a problem that I can solve? I might do that through a blog post or an infographic. And that content type it what needs to be served to a visitor at that stage of the path. Now that I know that I have a problem, um, I'm starting to do research. Is this the right solution for me? Um, and how do I do that? I do that through education materials, customer reviews, testimonials. I'm basically trying to get peer, uh, peer support in terms of is this, they're solving a problem just like mine, that seems interesting, great. Now I'm actually gonna consider, yeah, I might purchase this thing um, that you're selling. What I need for that, I need content like webinars and videos and, uh, and white papers and, and analyst reports. And then finally, I'm at the final decision. I've narrowed it down to a couple of vendors. Um, you're on the short list. What do I need now? I need case studies. I need ROI calculations. All of this content is model, uh, you can model inside of, of Drupal. And the power of doing it that way is I can pull out the appropriate content based on what stage you're on. Um, we've talked a little bit about reusable content. I call it atomic content. Um, but the idea here is that as you're beginning to think about personalization for Drupal, you may be breaking apart some of your content types that work perfectly well without, without personalization, but now I need it really uh, atomic. The good thing is Drupal's happy to do this. Um, we don't presuppose it's a page that you're rendering this content on. It might just be a block, and this block can play in lots of different places. That block might be delivered to an email, for example. That block might be delivered in other channels that I want to personalize your content on. Maybe I want to take the content from that block and put it uh, uh, on a social channel, for example. A lot of what we talked about is rules-based um, personalization. Um, the easy way to think about that is, you know, if then else, right? If you are in segment A, then I will show you content B. Um, Drupal, of course, does dynamic personalization. And, and for any sort of strategy at scale, you're going to end up here. You're going to end up with programmatic personalization, hopefully, because there just aren't enough hours in the day for marketers to build campaigns. Um, fortunately, these are, again, cornerstones of what we call Drupal. Views, and particularly views arguments, um, is a very powerful way to do personalization. Um, what I'm showing here in the little sidebar is I'm going to build this segment for a, a particular uh, location. Again, here's Boston. Do I really want to build 500 segments, one for every possible city? Probably not. What I really want to do is just feed in the city and let Drupal figure it out. What content works for Boston, what content works for uh, a given persona. So there's ways to do that. Views, um, uh, basically looking at term analysis, the similarity by terms is for both D8 and D7. Um, content recommendations using external libraries. Um, these are all ways we can do dynamic content with Drupal. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about with Drupal is if we break down how we create our content, we can get really powerful results. And I call this contextual rendering. You know, one of the first steps that we do with personalization is we're going to do a content audit. We're going to figure out what content you have, what personas you want to talk to, and it just becomes like a, you know, an M by N sort of grid. You've got five personas and, you know, five possible products. Great, I need a lot of content. Go, go to work. Go do your homework and create a lot of content. In reality, that's probably not scalable. Um, in reality, what you probably want to do is something closer to contextual rendering. And, and the best example I can think of this is that we all do, or at least think about doing, is mobile versus desktop. The things I want to achieve on a mobile device are going to be different. The content I want to consume on a mobile device is going to be different than what I want to do on a desktop. Or long form versus short form content, depending on who the visitor is and what they 
told you implicitly, but I'm watching lots of videos. Great, let's surface more videos because that's what you like to see. I'm reading all the way to the end of page of really long form content. Man, you're in the research phase. I'm going to show you more long form content. So we can prioritize or reorganize it by putting meta content around the actual content. What I'm showing here on the, on the side is I've broken up a page into individual paragraphs, and this is using the paragraphs module, and then I'm adding the actual um, uh, taxonomy uh, 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 segmentation to the paragraph level. Why would I want to do that? Because with that metadata, and this is pretty easy for an editor to say, great, this paragraph is related to multi-car family. If I feed in multi-car family as my, as my segment argument, I can have this paragraph float to the top and be more prominent. The rest of the content is still there. I don't have to write a landing page just for multi-car families. What I want to do is, is highlight what's important to them. So uh, we've lived a little bit of time here for some uh, some questions. Thank you so much for coming to our session today. Does anyone, if anyone has any questions, there's a mic uh, right over here in this aisle. If you wouldn't mind stepping to the microphone, and we'll take any questions you have. I'm really loud, so I just want to... <laughs> okay, cool. I'll repeat the question. A good the question. question was, how do we not get up in our customers' grills? <laughs> uh, great question. The question was, uh, personalization can be creepy. Uh, I consider this to be, uh, I refer to this as privacy concerns, right? Anytime we're capturing personal data, capturing users' data, and using that data in some way, we absolutely have to be sensitive to that. Uh, there's no one answer to this. I, I believe that uh, the way to do this Number one, first and foremost, is implement personalization in small steps along the way using basic information that is uh, based on criteria that can be automatically detected by the browser or data that the user has explicitly provided. Uh, and to make sure that the user is aware contextually as to how you got their data, I think is key. But it really does depend on the, the business case. I think it's an excellent question. And the name of the game is being sensitive to the privacy policy of your given organization. Yeah, I, I would also I would add that you know, a lot of what we do with personalization is, is analytics in another name. right? I don't think there's a single person in this room who doesn't use analytics on their web properties. Um, you know, you'd have to. So the type of information we're personalizing on, you're already capturing for the purposes of analytics. Um, if we're talking about PII, then that needs to be explicitly called out and, then, and just don't put it in the system if you don't want to record it. There's ways to um, anonymize the PII and still make it unique um, through hashing and things like that. So we work through those concerns um, in certain industries. So healthcare industry, that's a pretty big concern. Um, even in government, we see personalization in government. So there's a, a state of Georgia that wants to do personalization, but they don't want the big brother effect, right? They don't want to know you for all of time versus, you know, um, uh, maybe a B2B company wouldn't have that concern. So what they've done is they've shortened the session of personalization, meaning that I'm going to learn about you in the current session that you're in, and then I'm going to forget about you. Well, what's the point of that? Well, the point is just very quickly I can see, oh, you're from out of state. Now let me surface relevant information and be um, and let you find what you're looking for. You're looking for relocating to the state. You're looking for uh, um, starting a business in the state. Um, so in that session I can be a lot more relevant but not know that you're moving here a week from now. Does that help? Question right here. How about um, more about DA, personalization in DA? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Great question. Yeah. So the name of the, I think what we were emphasizing in the talk today is taxonomy and metadata. Obviously, that's the focus of a, an approach as far as Drupal is concerned. And whether D8 or D7, that's, that's going to be true. I used examples in this presentation of specific contrib modules that provide a starting point or a framework. Those modules are only available for D7 today. That's why I didn't show D8 modules in that way. So a D8 solution today, at least at this point in time, in terms of the D8 uh, uh, cycle, uh, is going to be more of a custom approach, again, based on taxonomy and metadata in that way. That's how we would approach it, for example. Yeah, I would say that. Um you know, from, from Aqua's perspective, that D8 is really exciting for personalization. So if you're going down the road of using Aquia Lift, um, D8 is something we'll absolutely support today. Um, the exciting part about uh, where we're headed with the product is that because of the way um, we've approached building campaigns, we can deliver personalized Drupal content 
onto other platforms. That's where we wanted the product to go. Um, so that Drupal becomes you know, the source of truth for all this content. It's used with, but the actual, uh, what we call the actual uh, glass, the, uh, the, what the actual is displaying the page, doesn't necessarily have to be Drupal anymore, which um, is fantastic. So that's what we think about D8 and, and personalization. Cool, question in the back. Absolutely. Sure. Um, so there's really two, there's two parts to that solution. One is, um, where am I putting the profiles in the event stream? And, and fundamentally, building infrastructure for recording massive event streams is not the same as a web infrastructure. You wouldn't want to record that event stream against your web infrastructure, which is why storing the profiles inside of Drupal is not a scalable solution, right? It looks a lot closer to what analytics looks like from an infrastructure perspective. So that's where the profiles live there. Um, in terms of actually delivering the content, there's a couple approaches. One is um, is uh, dynamic rendering using AJAX and that sort of thing. Um, so I have a, a placeholder and it calls back to the web head, the web server to get the dynamic content. Um, the way we do it with Lyft um, in the current version is we actually, by default, render the variations in the DOM and deliver that so it's fully cacheable. Um, so you don't have to go back to the web head to get that content. That doesn't work for every campaign, um, but for most it does. Yeah, the, similarly I would add, um, even the kind of proof of concept uh, module example that I showed, personalization, uh, works in this way where the HTML returned, HTML start tag to end tag is fully cacheable. It contains some JavaScript that once the page is downloaded, the JavaScript fires and does the, the dynamic pieces in that way. So that, that high level architecture of JavaScript doing the dynamic pieces and making the pages, cache, pages cacheable as possible. We see that across different solutions. Again, one of the reasons why we recommend using a third-party service for doing this is that we externalize not only the user profiles, but we offload a lot of the performance overhead to the service in that way as well. Uh, question in the back right there. Yeah, I can build on that. How does that work with the CDN? Is it the CDN hmm? Yeah, so or? basically all of the dynamic bits are client side, so it's cached and, and it'll work with a CDN for sure. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about and haven't seen yet is how Big Pipe is going to impact personalization. Um, because we've talked about Big Pipe being for authenticated users and spending up, uh, speeding up that, you know, that rendering process. It's a hop, skip, and a jump to have it work for anonymous users too. Um, I haven't seen a module that begins to use Big Pipe in that way, and if I don't see it for too long, then we're going to roll up the sleeves and do it. By the way, if you haven't heard of Big Pipe or you're not familiar with what John was just talking about, Sorry, yeah. Google Big Pipe, it's amazing. It's a new, it's a new technology that's now uh, being built into Drupal 8, and um, it basically makes Drupal 8 a lot faster. Uh, as soon as I learned about it and read about it, I got very excited about it. So if you're not familiar with that, definitely check that out. Yeah, sorry about that. That's a Drupalism. So everybody's used Big Pipe in this room, I, I bet. Cool. Uh, no, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. You guys used Facebook, right? <laughs> yeah? No, no one's used Facebook. You haven't used Facebook. <laughs> everybody else uses Facebook. So the way Facebook renders a page is effectively what Big Pipe is, right? It, it renders the, the containers, the things that can be cached immediately and then filters in dynamically uh, the dynamic bits. Uh, Drupal 8.1, that's part of core, so every one of our sites using Drupal 8.1 or later has that rendering technology for free. So we get Facebook um, style and quality of page rendering. That's primarily for authenticated users, right? You think of an authenticated user, most of the page is cached, uh, cacheable, excuse me, but the little bit says, welcome back, John, and maybe the block over here that's personalized for me, that's not. Drupal automatically, without coding, any further coding, um, pick out those bits and dynamically render them. So fast forward to personalization, we can use the same underlying mechanism um, to deliver uh, personalized content. Sorry. Right, and, and from a user experience point of view, what this means is that there's, there's also a perceived speed increase. The page appears quicker, but is actually continuing to load dynamically, although the, the body of the page, if you will, has already been displayed. Uh, there was a question over back here. Yep. Yeah, uh, 
I'll take a stab at that, and certainly. Uh, so oftentimes with personalization, we're starting off with the idea that there's, a, there's some default content, if you will. There's like some base version of the page. Uh, typically, Google will index that. We can additionally, once we detect specific attributes, dynamically swap out versions of the page to enhance or optimize the experience in that way. But oftentimes, the way we might think about it is having uh, an initial version of the, of the content that is displayed if we have no information, remembering that all visitors start out completely anonymous, so we need to display something without knowing something about the person. And that's typically what you would start uh, by optimizing for SEO in that way. Um, anything else? Yeah, we're not seeing any penalty for personalization. Um, Google now renders JavaScript on the pages too, so they're seeing the default experience. Um, for good measure, we do wrap the default content in a no script tag. So for, uh, for search crawlers that aren't as sophisticated as Google, that's what they're indexing. Cool. Question over there? Yeah, so it's, Just re repeat the question. So the question was, uh, is, is, the, is the data shared across third-party services? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. It depends on which the service you're using. So um, generally speaking, you own your own data warehouse with Acquia, right? So we don't share it between clients. Other people do. Um, they call those data management platforms or DMPs. They begin to aggregate the things you do across all the web into a profile. Um, so, for example, if I pay for a DMVP provider from, like, say, a Lotomy or um, a Blue Kai or somebody like that, they know that I like surfing and, and soccer because I, they collected me over all the websites. So there are platforms that do that. Um, from my perspective, corporate website is it's a private data, uh, database, data storage. If I could add to that, too, in, in, with the solutions architect hat on, we're often thinking about identifying where does the customer data live. It often doesn't just live in one database. There's, database, there's data about the customer, for example, in an email uh, marketing platform about emails that have been sent to them or have been delivered or not. There's data in a CRM like Salesforce, et cetera. So the name of the game is identifying where the, database, uh, where the data lives and seeing if we can programmatically make connections between these systems to unify them from a personalization strategy perspective. Uh, question in the back over there. Oh, uh, you want to track one visitor across the multiple sites. So uh, this would absolutely be, depending on the, the solu solution you use, uh, John can certainly speak to Lyft, uh, which, which supports this, uh, this very idea. Again, one of the benefits of externalizing the personalization platform is so you can do exactly what you're talking about, right? If you were, you're personalizing entirely within Drupal, but then you have another non-Drupal piece of your digital ecosystem that you want to track on, um, Drupal would have to kind of have insight into that. Whereas if we externalize the personalization platform, whether it's Lyft or one of the other services, uh, we can plug that into all different experiences or channels. Yeah, generally speaking, we want to use first-party cookies, not third-party cookies. Um, and what I mean by that, it's tied to the domain. The reason why is because increasingly, because of privacy concerns, um, browsers are shipping that don't even accept third-party cookies. So most solutions are going to fail for personalization before too long. Um, using first-party cookies is probably not going to get turned off. First-party cookies are used for lots of things like your session and stuff like that. Um, people aren't going to just willy-nilly turn off first-party cookies. So for multi-site, what I need to do now is be able to say, okay, you have an ID of XYZ on this site and an, and an ID of ABC on this site. How do I reconcile those two profiles? Depending on the solution you choose, you probably have the ability to merge profiles. That's a fairly automatic process with Lyft. Um, other platforms might have different uh, views on that. I don't know. Okay. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be running out of time shortly. If we, if we don't get to your question today, I've got our, our Twitter handles on the page here. Feel free to, re to reach out to us. Uh, you had a question right here? Mm -hmm. mm. In terms of the Drupal technical integration, yep. So using uh, contrib modules, for example, to integrate with the Salesforce APIs, where we'd start there. Um, what, what more specifically uh, are you interested in?
Yeah, um, I mean, at a high level, what we're talking about doing is integrating with the API provided by Salesforce. There's some awesome modules that take a lot of the hard work out of doing that for us and identifying which fields on the Salesforce side are going to be corresponding which fields on the Drupal side at a high level is how we might look at that. Anything else? Yeah, I would say that if they're known visitors, that's what we're talking about if it's in Salesforce, then um, the transporting Salesforce data to Drupal and back forth is pretty well pretty well supported uh, by the community. Um, it's a mature solution um, using the Salesforce API. It's not particularly difficult. Um, you know, when I think about your problem, what I'm really thinking about is account-based marketing and vertical marketing, right? Um, and that also has to apply to anonymous users. So how can I do that for them as well? Uh, so there's other solutions. You, I mentioned third-party data you can buy. Um, one of them is demand-based. Um, so your solution stack would involve Salesforce plus demand-based plus Drupal. Demand-based is going to identify what the company is just based on the IP address. And you can say, great, for this company, I want they're in this particular vertical. I want to do this to them. I want to show them this content. Or based on this company, actual company name, I know this about them. They're a preferred customer or they're, you know, that sort of thing. I want to do, show them this type of content. So. There's more to the stack than just Salesforce if you're doing account-based marketing. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid we are out of time. If you do us a favor, go to the Drupal dot, uh, DrupalCon website and uh, evaluate the session. And thank you again so much for coming today. Appreciate it. Thanks.